Hello and welcome back to Beyond Boards, a podcast dedicated to the actions and interests of skaters beyond skateboarding. My guest today is nothing short of an icon, first and foremost in skateboarding, but also in surf cultures. Thomas Campbell grew up in Dana Point between LA and San Diego and started skating in the late 70s. As he said on multiple occasions, skateboarding gave me everything as far as being a creative person. Creative is an understatement considering everything Thomas has explored as an artist throughout his life, from making zines, shooting skate photos and writing articles for skate magazines, designing board graphics, filming and directing skate and surf full-length films, sewing, painting, running a record label, working on exhibitions all over the world. He's done it all. I had the opportunity to sit down with him for a quick chat as he is finishing his new surf film Yi Wo and got to surprise him with questions from a few lifelong friends of his. So here's my conversation with Thomas. I hope you'll enjoy it. So yeah, so let's see. I have this first one here from Joe Lloyd. Wow. He's an old friend of yours who used to take photos under the name Xeno, if I'm not mistaken. Correct, correct. So he said, Thomas went to his local record store and bought the Jane's Addiction vinyl album, Nothing's Shocking, when it was initially released. So this would be August 1988. I went to his family's house and we listened to the album on the record player in his room. We immediately loved the sonic assault of this album. We are leaving his house to go skate and Thomas brings the album downstairs and hides it on the outside of the house, either near or in the trash bins. Now, I think this is because his parents would disapprove of the album cover art, which is a sculpture of naked female Siamese twins with their heads on fire. So the question would be, Thomas, back in 1988, why did you hide your Jane's Addiction Nothing's Shocking 12-inch vinyl record on the outside of your family's home? Um, so I think Joe got it wrong, but this was the scenario. That wasn't what happened. Mm -hmm. What happened is I grew up working on fishing boats. I work up growing at a fishing place and, uh, and sometimes working on the boat, sometimes mostly working in the office. And so I started there when I was nine, nine years old. And I started like cleaning the fishing boats and I worked till I was 19. Mm Mm-hmm. And all the money I made, I was supposed to save half of it. I never did. But basically, all the money that I made, I spent on records. And like mm-hmm. that was exactly the moment when the CD came in, and then vinyl was worth not very much. But I was really mm-hmm. into vinyl. So uh, me and my friends, like Chris Reed and Tony Vatican, we would always be on the search. So at a certain point, my mom was mad at me. My parents were mad at me because they never saved any money. And I had so many records, like I had like 2,500 records and a small room. Wow. And then they were like, what is the matter with you? You can't bring (laughs) any more records into this house. So what I would do is when I would get home, I would put the records on the side of the house below my window on the second floor. Mm -hmm. And I would drop down a fishing lure with a bigger fishing reel and heavier line test. And uh, I would reel the records, I would hook it, and I'd reel it up the side of the house into my room so I didn't have to bring them through the front door. So your parents wouldn't see them? Yeah, yeah. Wow. (laughs) And so, you know, I wouldn't say in general I feel like I have an addictive personality, but maybe towards music. Not anymore, not so much, but I mean, I love music, but... Yeah, yeah. So maybe whatever, I don't think that that was what happened, but... uh, Mm -hmm with Joe, but if you took three people yesterday in a room and tried to ask them what they saw, you'll get different it stories. Be the same. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. But that's cool. You did your you did your research getting um yeah. Joe to be be in there. That's really cool. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Hopefully there's a couple other surprises like uh, like him, so all right, let's do the next one. This one is an audio one. Hey Thomas Campbell, Max Schaff here. I was wondering what time in the history of skateboarding do you think was the most creative? Like the time you look back on and you say, I'm so proud to be a skateboarder and be part of this. I Early stereo comes to mind for me, or like the 80s punk zine part of skateboarding. But I was just thinking, in your opinion, what year or what years in skateboarding was that, in your opinion? Mm, cool. 
That's nice you got Max to ask something. Uh, I mean, I would just say, like, for me, like, the age I am and and everything, uh, I would just say, like, the most creative thing that ever happened probably for me in skateboarding was probably Memory Screen. Oh, yeah. um, The Alien Workshop video. Mm Mm-hmm. And just, like, just the feeling it gave you and, like, how good everyone was skating in it and, like, you know, whatever. I'm, I've i always been kind of, like, like into skateboarding for, like, the pure expression of it and not into the team aspect or, like, competition yeah. or... And I feel like that was just a really cool synthesis of, like, creativity and really good skating and just being like, oh, fuck, you know, and it's kind of fucked up and... Mm. And the music is really good, like a lot of Dinosaur Jr. in it. And just like, it's just really like loose and creative and like they were just feeling it. And so I I feel like that's always, I mean, to this day, like, you know, I'm working on a movie now and I'm like, I'm not, I haven't gone back and watched Memory Screen, but I just like think about it as like kind of a guiding light. Yeah. Yeah. Of just kind of like, you know, life is so strange and existence is so strange and i feel like it it mirrored that well mm-hmm. yeah what's the movie you're working on right now is it the yi wo movie uh-huh yeah okay. yeah it's a my new the new sir film that i'm working on right which is kind of different than the ones i worked on before it's just like a little bit more it's kind of like a weird poem and i guess in a way it reflects how strange and kind of dark the current world scenario is yeah so there's a bit of tension in it. And um, I mean, not unlike my last skateboard film. The old destruction. Yeah. I mean, that kind of had to, like a similar tension. Right. That kind of was expressing the... Because that was shot during the time when Trump was elected, right? Yeah. Yeah. So it was pretty... I mean, whatever. I, I Yeah. Fuck Trump and fuck them all. <laughs> like, really. I, I'm, I'm really not... I don't think any... Unless politicians really have people's, the people at the nexus of like being, like helping people and helping the planet, then most of them don't because they're just owned, you know? Yeah. So. So memory screen is a a time period that really summarizes your, like what you, what you enjoyed very much. Yeah. And, and also it just like at the time, you know, how old I was, I was just like, wow, like this is so impactful. Mm. But I don't know. I feel like at first when you were asking me, I was thinking about like skating, like how creative skating is. Mm -hmm. And like, I just think like, it's just always really creative or, or, you know, like today, just like the way people are skating today is amazing. You know, like it's totally amazing. And then there's just like, people are getting into some totally different rhythms and seeing like things in like a really amazing way that's, you know, is like, really creative you know so all right so the next one is from damon way great he said what is it about tones on tail that speaks to you in a different manner than bauhaus and love in rockets (laughs) (laughs) that's really weird i did an interview like two days ago for uh looking sideways or something oh yeah and we uh, did that one a few months ago i think i listened to that one i think that came out this summer yeah, but they did a follow-up one with me like a few days ago, and we were talking about Tones on Tail. Oh, nice. Okay. Um, I think the reason I like Tones on Tail so much is I feel like maybe it was like didn't have a lot of like pressure on it, so they were free mm-hmm. when they made it, but they were also really good and free within the context of making it. Mm-hmm. And they weren't like, we have to like make something that's going to like change the world or anything. But I think that probably is what made it maybe the best of all three of those. Mm -hmm. I don't expect people to know even what it is. But (laughs) so Bauhaus was Peter Murphy, Kevin Haskins, David Jay and Daniel Ash. And then when they broke up, Peter Murphy went and did like Dally's Car. Mm -hmm. Kevin Haskins and Daniel Ash went and made Tones on Tail. David J went and did like a solo record. Okay. But I think they they made Tones on Tail with a guy named Glenn Campling, who I think was their roadie. I think he played bass. Mm-hmm. I think maybe it was to fulfill their Bauhaus contract. I don't I'm not positive. But anyway, there's a record called Pop. There's two different versions of it. Okay. And I think it's really one of the greatest records ever. It's so great. And that one's from Tones on Tail or from Bauhaus? Tones on Tail. 
Okay, nice. Yeah, I'll look it up. I I don't know those these bands very. I know Bauhaus, of course, but the two other ones I didn't know that well. So I'll go check them out for yeah, sure. Yeah, super good. All right, so the next one is from Julian Dijkmans from Cascade in Berlin. You worked on with him on some projects for Hermes back in the day with uh, Fred Martin. Yep. So he asked, what is the right balance between style and performance? Um, I think you just know it when you see it. And I mean, we're, we're all just in an accumulation of circumstance, right? Mm. So whatever happened to us in our life until the moment that we're observing the thing that we're trying to understand, all of those things that happen until that moment are affecting what our feeling is. So it's like we're all going to have different feelings about how different things are going to impact us at any given time. So, uh, yeah, I'd say I don't know. And I will know when I'm discerning it at the moment I'm discerning it. Mm. But I mean, whatever I like in skateboarding, I've always liked people that skate fast and that there's like an element of sketch, mm -hmm. you know, like whatever, like Mark Gonzalez or John Cardiel or or T-Funk or something like that where you're just like, ah, mm. like, you know, I like that stuff. Yeah, I don't know. I like people that are weird that just do whatever they they're feeling like. I can't remember his name, but you know the guy Roller Surfer. He goes into Roller yeah, Surfer. Ben Ben Koppel. Yeah, Ben Ben. Yeah. Uh, yeah, he's amazing. Yeah, I mean, I like that too. It's like I like people that just explore yeah. and aren't really impacted. He doesn't seem to be impacted by anything. Mm -hmm. he, it seems like he's he's like, hey man, I'm just doing my dance over here like this. Right. And, Yeah. And whatever, I think that's really cool. Yeah, yeah. He's definitely in a, in his own bubble, kind of. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, he, he came over to my house once, and um, we talked. Really, we just talked. I, I don't even think he skated, if I can remember. Mm -hmm. But, man, like he's he's probably one of the more most intelligent skateboarders I've ever met. Like it was, it was a, it was an amazing conversation. Like awesome. wow. one, one of the most expanding conversations I've had. And I would say probably the other most, I don't think a lot of people really know Steve Olson, like the younger Steve Olson, but mm -hmm. he's probably one of the most uh, interesting intellects of all skateboarders to me. Like we've had some really wonderful conversation and he's a good friend. And mm -hmm. Yeah, he's really cool. Very spiritually ori oriented. All right, so then I have a few questions from Ed Templeton. Cool. I'll see him tomorrow. Oh, nice. Cool. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So he asked, are you ever afraid to go Bucknar? And what is rule number one? Huh. Are those all those questions? No, no, there's a few more. <laughs> um, let's see. I would say going Bucknar is less my style now. I think Bucknar would be like when you're just putting all of your energy into something. And kind of with a deficit on the other side of, of it, um, mm -hmm. but maybe for the greater good. And rule number one is something that changes because we're changing, right? Mm -hmm. So I would say I go semi-Bucknar now, and the rule would probably be just keep going, don't worry about it. All right, so then he asked, do you remember taking me surfing and how shitty I was? Yes. <laughs> When was that? Do you remember? I think I've taken him surfing a few times, but it's kind of amazing because he's so talented. Like he's mm. so physically talented. Like one of the most, you know, he's he's like such an incredible, one of the most incredible skateboarders. Mm. I, don't, I don't think I don't know if he gets his full due for how how good he really was. Mm -hmm. But uh, yeah, just to take him surfing and see him sucking so bad and purling. <laughs> Purling means like when you're going down the wave and your nose just goes into the water and then you go over. He was just doing that repeatedly. <laughs> But I think if he put some time in, he needs to. He's a little, he needs some exercise. Then he asked also, remember when I posed nude for you? Yes, I do. I've got the pictures. They'll come out at my new book. Okay. Actually, yeah, they should come out. They kind of look like they were... Uh, When was that? That was like 1992. I think we were just skating. I don't even know. I don't even know why, but 
he just like took off his clothes and I'm all stand over the, under that spotlight. And then the it was like long exposures, uh-huh. but they kind of they look like Francis Bacon. Oh yeah, drawings kind of. Anyway, yeah. When is that book coming out? Do you know? No, but I mean I, I have to finish my movie first, and then I want to make a book. I've been organizing it for like 15 years. It's called it. I thought it was going to be called Everything, but then the guy named uh painter just made a book called everything that's kind of in my same circle mm -hmm. so i'm not going to call it everything i'm not going to say what the name of it is even though i know it but it would probably be it would be an accumulation of photography from the beginning so it'd be like 1986 until like now wow and i'm still shooting for it so amazing it's going to be a pretty big book then yeah uh i don't like big books I like books that are easy to hold in your hands, so... Yeah, yeah. Probably, okay. maybe no more than 200 pages, and... I mean, it'll, you know, there doesn't have to only be one book, so... Sure, yeah, definitely. Whatever it wants to be. I, like, try to, like, let, let books just be what they want to be. Uh, I have a couple more from Ed. He said, do you remember doing the second Toy Machine ad ever? Yes, I do. I think there was a picture of a goose that my dad shot and stuffed and it was in his room and i took a picture of the goose i think the goose was in the ad okay <laughs> but i do i do remember when ad ed asked me he's like what do you think about the name toy machine and i was like that's a horrible that's a horrible name <laughs> don't do that and um i'm glad he didn't listen to me yeah and you know i think that's just a testament to like names just become what you make of them what you what yeah what you make of them and and he did a a great job and still doing a great job and yeah, yeah. so don't listen to me ed <laughs> don't listen to me and then his last question is get him to tell one of his epic surf stories morocco and the mural painting etc okay <laughs> that is an epic story though i don't know if you have enough time for it <laughs> okay so i'll just tell the beginning quick i hitchhiked Across America, I remember, I think, Tom Knox, not the English Tom Knox, the more important Tom Knox <laughs> in my book. Yeah. Whatever, English Tom Knox is great. But it's sad that there's two Tom Knoxes because <laughs> the first one really deserves a lot more credit than he gets. And um, anyway, that Tom Knox dropped me off on the side of the freeway mm -hmm. in Bakersfield. And I had like a stack of Top Ramen and a bottle of water. And then I hitchhiked with many stops to see Kevin Wilkins and Bernie McGinn in, in uh, Nebraska. And then, then I think Andy, Andy Jenkins picked me up and we went to Chicago for like a... As far as I know, the first really... I think it was the first really big skateboard art show. Okay. And whatever, all kinds of people were there. It was awesome. Ed and Spike and Mark and whatever. It was great. Mm -hmm. It was Dan Fields one. And then, then I hitchhiked to Woodward's Gate Camp. And then I hitchhiked to New York City. And then I was there. And I got to stay with Larry Clark for a few months. Oh, yeah. And yeah, then... Yeah. I heard that story uh, somewhere, yeah. Yep. And then I went to Europe. And then I went on tour. I, I flew to Europe on a $60 plane ticket and... Skin invited me on a tour with like Cardiel and Mark Gonzalez and Alan Peterson, Karmatasha, Ron Chapman, and Salman Aga. Mm -hmm. And we went all around the UK skating old skate parks and doing some demos. Then I went down to Spain. And then I met Fernando Albira. Oh, yeah, yeah. And then um, we won't get back to this in the story, but I came back and stayed with him and worked with him on his skateboard magazine. Okay. And then I stayed there in the split called Mundaka for like a month and um, went surfing. And then, oh, that's not true. Before I went to Spain, I went and stayed with Skin. After the tour, I went and stayed with Skin for two months in Wales. And I like painted pictures for a surfboard company, mm -hmm. like graphics, and I got some surfboards. And then I went to Spain and I went surfing. And I think I broke my first, I broke one of the surfboards in the first few days because it was kind of big. And then, and then anyway, then I met Ferdy. And then that kind of set up a long relationship that I would come back to. And then I went to Portugal for a month and I was camping in Portugal surfing. And then everyone in Portugal was like, oh, oh all these people were, I saw them in Spain and they went to Portugal and then they were going to Morocco and there's like, oh, it's really cheap. Mm. And so I went to Morocco and I was camping by this 
place called Anchor Point, which has a really good skate park right on the top of the hill now, right by it, which I've never been to. And then uh, I ran out of money after like a month, and then like I sold my surfboard and my tent and my sleeping bag and everything, and then I like went to the mountains like six hours away, and then I was up there, and I I don't even know how I did it, but I just told the guy at the hotel, I told him that I was a famous painter, and then I would paint a mural in the bedroom for the payment of staying in the room. Oh, okay. And and I was not a famous painter, <laughs> and uh, but I just I don't know, you know, being young and yeah, you, you and said that, uh, you why know. not? Let's try. Yeah, yeah, it worked. And uh, so then, I, I, whatever I was painting pictures and whatever, and then I was running out of money. So I, you know, in Morocco at the time, or probably I don't know, still like Moroccans can't buy alcohol. Oh yeah, oh well, yeah, it's a Muslim country, and yeah. Yeah, so I go, I go back, I get in the bus, and I go like six hours to the town Agadir, mm -hmm. and I buy wine, a bunch of wine, and then I like buy it there, and then because you couldn't buy it where I was, so I, right. and then I brought it back there, and then like was like selling the wine to the Moroccans <laughs> wow. to like get money because like I had no money. Okay. And then I heard that these other people were doing that, and they got caught, and they were in jail. Oof. Oh, yeah. And then I heard that they the cops were looking for me, <laughs> and at the t and I was up there for like a month or a little bit more than a month or something in in the mountains. And my friends were supposed to come get me like two weeks before. Mm -hmm. This Moroccan guy that lived in Paris and a New Zealand guy, and um, and they hadn't shown up, and then. I heard that the cops were maybe looking for me, and I was like, fuck. And then I was just like, starting to clean up my room and just get all ready to go. And then, like, right then, they showed up. Like, right when I was almost done cleaning, like, and they're like, hop in. And I just got in the car and drove away, and I didn't get in trouble. Oh, wow. <laughs> <laughs> Yikes. So, anyway, that's the abbreviated short rendition. Do you know if that paint, that mural painting is still there? Or, I mean, I, I guess you must not have gone back since then, but... Uh... I do know that some people I do know, not too long after I made it, had gone and asked and seen it. Okay. Honestly, it wasn't anything that great. I don't know. I don't really like stuff that I did. Mm. So what year would, have, would that have been? Like, that was early 90s then, I guess. That would have been like 91. Okay. That was a, f a few years before you moved to New York. Because I think you were there from 95 to 98 from what I read. Yes. Yeah. It might have been 92. Actually, it probably was 92. Mm -hmm. Because I, I was in Morocco over the new year, I think from 91 and 92. Yeah, something like that. Okay. I think. All right. So the following question is from Evan Smith. Oh, cool. And he said, how is it giving me a tattoo? The only tattoo you have ever given, he said it was a stick and poke tattoo. Um, it was one of the worst experiences ever. <laughs> really? Okay. I didn't realize how hard it was to like give a tattoo. Like I, I just never did it before. And then it like, it was small. It wasn't even very big, uh -huh. but it took like two and a half hours or something like it was just like it was just going on forever i mean i think it turned out cool but it was crazy i was like what the hell is this <laughs> but anyway i love i love evan and i'm glad that he has a tattoo and i probably will never do another one again not like that at least what, what was the tattoo do you remember what it was the the drawing oh it was just kind of like Yeah, I remember what it is, but it's like, it's kind of like a triangle with an eye in it, and I don't know. Okay. All right, the next one is an audio one. Let's see. Hey, Thomas. Dave Aaron here. Been a while. Wow. I guess I have a sort of fun question for you. Uh, you used to do some weird stuff with your grip tape. Can you explain to the listeners what that looks like, and uh, will it improve my backside smith grinds? See ya. I do the exact same thing to my grip tape now that I did then. I've always just like cut my grip tape into like four pieces. Mm -hmm. And like at the at the top of the bottom truck bolts, there's a line that's kind of like uneven. And then like it's wider on the left side and narrower on the right side in the front of the board. And then it's wider in the back left and narrower on the bottom left. Mm -hmm. And the way, and I cut it 
and it's just a little bit organic, and uh, it doesn't help with Smith grinds. <laughs> I don't know if it helps with anything. I mean, luckily, well, I've got like four tricks, and two of them are Smith grinds, so. <laughs> okay. So Dave was uh, someone you skated with in New York back in the day, right? Uh-huh, yep. We used to tack the metal curbs nonstop in a period when people really weren't curb skating. Mm-hmm. Because that was probably the peak of my skating was that I, I really am always embraced it. Now my curb game sucks bad. <laughs> How often do you skate these days? Do you try to skate pretty regularly or is it more like every now and then? or? Uh, once or twice a week. I skated like the day before yesterday I skated. My friend has a little kind of little cement thing in his backyard. I got to skate, which is fun. Okay, following questions from Tobin Yelland. Uh, let's see, the first one he said is, I remember you have some good hitchhiking stories. Could you share one, please? Um, one time my friend was like, oh, I want to go make out with this girl in like Jackson Hole, Wyoming. Do you want to come with me? And I was like, <laughs> okay. And then we went out there and then he left. And then I was like, I went hitchhiking from there up. I wanted to go see these girls that I knew up in like Missoula, Montana. Mm -hmm. So I went up there and then I ended up, the people that I wanted to see were, weren't there. And then I ha ended up hanging out with their like brothers and sisters and it was fun. And then I hitchhiked back from there, back towards like, I was going to go to see my friends that had a farm in Olympia, Washington. Mm -hmm. So then I hitchhiked back that way. And then I got to Seattle and a guy dropped me off. And then this Cadillac pulls up And I get in, and this guy, kind of like a black dude, like a pretty gangsterish kind of guy, he was just like pumping too short, like super loud, like so loud. And he had like leopard skin seats. Oh, and it wow. Smelled like you just dumped like a bottle of Chanel number no. five on the seats <laughs> or some cheaper. Anyway, it was crazy. And then he gets on the freeway and he's just like going like super fast. And like almost rear ending everyone on the freeway. And then he's like talking to me about how he had to like leave LA because he killed too many people. And I was just like, I was like, oh my God, oh my God. And then, this is how and it then ends. He, he, yeah, pretty much. And then he, he said he was going to like Tacoma, which is like not all the way to Olympia. And then he's like, where are you going? And I'm like, I'm going to Olympia. Mm -hmm. And then he's like, I'll take you. And, I'm, and I was like, ah, <laughs> like, like I was like, I wanted to like let me out. But then like, I didn't want to make him mad. Like it was like, <laughs> it was a weird circumstance. Yeah. And then uh, anyway, he took me there and he dropped me off and everything was fine. Wow. And uh, but it was really scary. That was definitely the scariest ride because also the mo the more scary thing was that like he was i don't know his driving style was crazy and he was like i said rear-ending everyone on the freeway yeah 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 and i was like oh my god totally gonna die tobin asked also what were you like as a teenager did you have a period of rebellion i think i've always had a period of rebellion you know like it definitely had it my parents were pretty strict and then i just realized that like Like, I didn't really have a very good communication with them where I could, like, really talk to them openly about, like, what was happening with me. Okay. And then they were very strict and kind of, like, Catholic. So I just kind of, like, realized that, like, I just had to present, like, a front that was functioning and then lie lie and do whatever I needed to do to do the, the life that I wanted to do. And um, it worked out. <laughs> it sure, sure <laughs> they, did, yeah. I figured out a, a combination that allowed me freedom, you know, but that's not, that's not ideal. That's not like, I wish, I wish I had more support emotionally from my parents sure. and I had a better communication with them. Yeah. I felt pretty isolated because it just didn't, you know, like I wasn't able to like confide in them because they would like use it against me to like control you know and whatever mm. so yeah i think i was subversive and wild during that period and i don't know if tobin would think that i was wild during the period we were spent a lot of time together but but there was a lot of fucking wild people in our world at that point so i might have been pale in comparison 
I read that you have um, five sisters. Were they also kind of rebellious as well? Or, or were they more like uh, closer to the way of living that your parents were telling you to behave and whatever? And There's a really big span of time. So like I'm in the middle. That's right. Yeah. Like I have three older and two younger. And the just older one's five years older. And the just younger one of me is five years younger. So like I was out yeah. kind of like... like in the middle. Yeah, I'd say my oldest sister was kind of rebellious. Um, she's kind of like 70s, kind of party girl mm -hmm. and whatever, you know, going to see the Rolling Stones and, and Bob Marley and partying. And my parents were not psyched about that. <laughs> But I don't know. I, I would say I'm, I'm an anomaly within the scenario. Then I have a few more from Tobin. He said, most people don't know that you're an awesome writer and interviewer. Can you share your favorite interview you ever did for Escape magazine? I mean, when I started, I was a, just a writer for probably five years. Like I was just writing mm -hmm. and um, or maybe even longer than that. I start. I mean, think of my first article was in Transworld when I was like 17. Mm -hmm. I don't think I got a camera, a real good camera until I was about 22 And so I was just writing. And also I didn't I didn't really want to take pictures because I just really wanted to skate. And I just felt like, you know, like I was getting to be at the sessions with like the best skaters. And then I got to interview them and do different things. I think one, I can't remember it specifically, but it's interesting that Tobin says that because I was with him. I interviewed Julian Stranger for his Transworld interview. Mm-hmm. And um, I really like that one. I think we drank a lot of beer. <laughs> and uh, I think he was pretty forthcoming. He has a very interesting life and, a bit, you know, is a very intelligent mm -hmm. person. So I think that one was really cool. And I remember, I remember, like, I grew up at the top of, like, a pretty steep hill. So I, I was pretty used to, like, bombing hills. And I had a pretty good proficiency in handling hills. And I remember that the day that I, like, interviewed, I think I maybe hung out with him for a few days at that time with him and Tobin and whatever, but... I remember like skating with like I think it was like Julian and Joey Trouche and maybe Mark Ar Mike Archimedes and and like trying to follow them mm -hmm. and like like I said I I I would say that I was pretty proficient at hills mm -hmm. I was not mm -hmm. I was like they they were just like foul yeah. and I and my foot was just on fire because I was like had my foot down because like it it was too much yeah, yeah they sure. were so they were so, so incredible mm. yeah but I didn't lose them so at least that yeah 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 <laughs> yeah all right so Julian Stranger yeah yeah I think I mean whatever a lot of the ones that I liked were just people who were my friends like Ethan, maybe Ethan Fowler for Big Brother I did one or Maybe Ed, I did, I did a Ed one in um, Transworld. Can't remember all the things, but but yeah. Anyway, I d that's cool that he said that because I do feel like I used to be pretty good at it. Mm -hmm. Like I used to, but it, now it feels like the the writing engine is kind of like rusted, mm. shut, and out in out in the field. But for this photography book I want to do, it's going to have a writing component. Okay, so. I'm going to have to go out in the field and get that engine working again. He asked a couple other things. He said, working as a photographer for Transworld, did you ever send in some personal photos by mistake? Um, I think I sent in everything. I'm not sure what he's referring to, but I'm sure he's probably referring to something that happened. You would send them the whole rolls, right? You wouldn't like... Uh, yeah. No, no. They would. They would develop everything and... Generally, the guys in the dark room, like Steve Sherman or Johnny Donahue or my friend Heather Yarion or Heather Rose or Ray Potes, those are like, I guess those would be the five people that were in the dark room and kind of like the photo techs at the time that I worked for Transworld. And they were all my friends. So mm -hmm. I could be like, hey, could you print this thing for me that's not for the magazine? And they'd be like, yeah. Oh, I see. Okay. And whatever. I don't know. I didn't get in too much trouble, I don't think. Okay. Probably some, but yeah. His last question is, I loved the Ari Markopoulos article you did for Transworld showcasing his photos to the general skate world. Was this easy to convince the editors to run? I like that one too. Yeah, I don't think it was too hard. 
I think by then they trusted me. You know, I had my own column. It was called Crockpot. And I think I knew what they wanted by then. And I, I generally just tried to give them, you know, come up with creative ideas that I knew they would like. I think that was one of them. And whatever, he had enough of like cool photos of like the the happening, you know, it was probably, that was like probably like 96 or 97 mm-hmm. when I was living in New York. Right. And he was down a lot with the first generation of like the Supreme team kind of at that time. So I knew that they would want that. They always wanted East Coast stuff. Mm-hmm. And that was good for me because when I lived there, it was easy to get things published because they didn't have very many photographers in the East. Okay, then I have a question from Sergei Vutuk. Is that how you say his name? Yeah, yeah. Who made the titles on Yule Destruction and uh, was a great artist as well. Super. So he said, one impressive impression you left on me is that when it comes to creating a film, it's not just about your work. It's more of a collective process, some kind of document of a scene. Can you tell us about the way you approach your filmmaking in that regard? I mean, I think in in making those kinds of films, it's just like, like I tried to get my friends that were excellent at doing that kind of work. Like, I think the main people that helped me film the movie, I mean, the main person was probably Fred Martin, uh, French Fred. Yep. And John Minor. And I think Manzuri was also on the project, wasn't he? Yeah, a little bit, like a little bit of Manzuri and Connor Weiss to help with some drone stuff. But I mean, I think it's like, I think a lot of things that I think about, maybe I've said this before, but I think about like Miles Davis, like all of his bands, I feel like, especially even like when Coltrane and Dolphy were in his band and just like, it was just the gnarliest and you had to practice. And I just feel like how I like to think about it is like, you just get the players in the room. Mm Mm-hmm. You get your good skaters and you get the good people that can document it and then you just go. And uh, yeah, I don't know. I mean, (laughs) and then you just see what you got and then also try to like try to make an effort to like get other kinds of things that will support visually just the skating so it's more interesting and you feel more about like what the space was like and what the feeling was like that's some things i like to do Mm -hmm. but yeah and then just see what you got and then see what you can make you know so anyway i appreciate that from sergey and you know that that movie was kind of like the end of like a big circle Mm -hmm. uh for me of my life because skateboarding gave me creativity and you know then like i went around and then certain periods when skateboarding got like a little too tech and a little too divided yeah it was like not really what i was into like i still like skating i just didn't like the bullshit in it yeah and i felt like it came back around where like kids kind of like evan smith or whatever were just kind of like i don't give a fuck about anything And I'm just going to skate everything and whatever. Mm -hmm, Like, mm -hmm. to me, that's how I always thought. Always, Me and my friends were like, oh, there's a pool. Let's skate it. Oh, there's a ledge. Let's skate it. Yeah, yeah. And whatever. I don't care if you're not like that. But I just don't like when people are like... Judgmental or clicky. Yeah, yeah. Which is fucking stupid. Yeah, yeah. So, anyway, I liked where skateboarding was coming back to. So then when I made that movie, it was kind of the big circle of that. And then I really like Sergei's, his style of writing. Mm-hmm. And it kind of harked back to like when I was making fanzines and, you know, oh, yeah. when I was kind of in that culture. And then I just thought it was like a perfect way. And his handwriting's way better than mine. So, mm. or I liked it better for that application. Okay, I have one from Sean Cliver. So he said, ask him about the time he shat himself in the airport and shook the balls out of his pant leg and kept on going. Tremaine told me that story once, and I always wonder if the details were accurate. <laughs> um, it is true. I think I was, in, I was in Las Vegas. So that's Big Brother Days, I, I guess. Yeah, but I wasn't I, I wasn't there. I was with my some friends and uh I was there I think I was there for like a snowboard trade show. Okay. Cuz I think I did some graphics for a snowboard company and I was out there and um we had a like a really big night and uh basically didn't go to sleep and then we're at the I think I was staying at the Treasure Island Hotel and then 
I like in the morning, like the sun was coming up and then I like, I jumped in the moat at the Treasure Island mm-hmm. and then I kind of came out of it and I got out of the moat and I could see all the security guards running after me. Like I could see them coming because yep. I was in the moat and then they were up on like raised platforms coming at me and then I like climbed out of the moat and started running. But I was pretty drunk and... um I think I got to like, in my mind, I'm like, oh, I can just duck in these bushes. Mm -hmm. So I ducked in the bushes, but I didn't realize that like, because I was wet, I just had like a path of like water on the ground. So they just like, when I thought I was safe, safe (laughs) in the bushes, they just followed the path right (laughs) into the bushes and got me. And then, and then they, they took me and then they said, you can never stay here again at the treasure Island. Go get your stuff. (laughs) <laughs> and then I was already late to the plane. Okay. I was like trying to get to the plane on time. And I think my body was not happy with me about all the things I'd ingested uh, <laughs> in the night before. Yeah. And that's when the... Uh, Didn't have time to go to the toilet. No, I, I, I think things weren't going right. <laughs> and uh, so, but see, I shouldn't have told Termaine that. <laughs> but, uh, now the whole world will know. <laughs> yeah, yeah. That would be something Cliver would ask. <laughs> okay, the next question is from Eric Swisher. So he oh, said, cool. I always wondered about the root of my all-time favorite Thomas-ism, Yar. Where does that come from? And in your mind, what does it mean? Hope all is well, amigo. Talk soon. Um, I think Yar, yar is, a, is a nautical term. It means everything is ready to go. Mm-hmm. So... I think I've always just thought about it as like a positive affirmation of sorts. And I don't know, I don't think I necessarily use it in the exact right context, but you know, not all words are used in the right context. All right, the following one is an audio one. Hey, Thomas. Hey, what's up? It's Chris Colburn. My question for you is a two parter. The first one What is your favorite film that you've ever made? And why? And my second question is, what got you into sewing? And how many sewing machines do you own? Another talented skater. Yeah, Cookie. He's got more talent than most people together. (laughs) Let's see. Uh, It's hard to compare skate and surf films. I mean, they're they're obviously going to be quite different. I mean, I would would just say The Old Destruction, really. Yeah. I mean, I would probably just say, like, my new surf film, if I had to pick one in each genre. Mm -hmm. But it's not done yet. It's close, though. It's really close. Cool. Actually, I'm going to work on that after we get off off here. But, um, yeah. And then I got inspired to do sewing from Barry McGee and Margaret Kilgallen. They were, like, sewing some of their paintings together or drawings together years ago. Mm Mm-hmm. And then I I kind of like messed around with it for quite a while, maybe a few years before I kind of like let anyone see it because like I didn't really, I wanted whatever I was going to do to be a little bit more original than kind of copy really what they did. And then eventually I felt like it was more in its own space. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, so that's been part of my practice for probably about 20 years now. Okay. Do you still do it today or is it, or do you kind of come back to it every now and then or I was sewing the day before yesterday, the day before that, and the day before that. Okay. Oh yeah, okay. So yeah, I'm, I'm it's kind of a go to thing though, also. It's it's something that it's nice it teaches me a lot because the more that you kind of like don't worry about stuff the way that I do it, and if you make mistakes, like your pieces become better. Oh, yeah. So it's like, so it kind of teaches you to like not worry about mistakes. So you're like, oh, I fucked that up. Okay, I'll cut it out. Oh, it would look better upside down. Or mm. or I put it up on the wall and I, and I take it off the wall three months later because it fits in another thing three months later, you know. So mm. it's just like, like not to be so precious about everything, mm. hopefully. Yeah, I find it super interesting that you do so much different things like painting, sculpture, sewing, filmmaking, photography. Is there something that you've never explored and that you'd maybe one day like to get into? Uh, I mean, I'm just about to probably start like exploring oil painting more. Mm-hmm. 
which is not something I used to do like when I was real young a little bit, but I don't know much about it. But actually yesterday I was like listening to, you know, like a audio thing of the singer Joni Mitchell getting interviewed. Okay. And she said something really interesting because she's a painter and it was interesting listening to her because she was like talking about, you know, like when she might get stuck working on songs or something, she just goes and paints and then... And something that I, you know, I've thought about, but in a way, but haven't articulated in the way she articulated, is that it's kind of like a farmer and she's like changing her crops. Oh, yeah. To like give, you know, different nutrients. Right, yeah. And changing her crops, she keeps the balance. And I think that's how I feel, definitely. Like, you know, like I'll do one thing and then I'll move to the next thing. And then by the time I get back to the other thing, it's it's fresh again. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So, yeah. And it, I think it also, if I just painted all the time, I would probably be... Go crazy. Crazy. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. It feels like it. It's It's too emotional. Yeah, I'm sure. To do too much. Okay, I have a question from Jamie Owens, but it's kind of linked to something you mentioned earlier. But he said, tell a story from your trip to Morocco with Barley, Rowley, and Cairo, Steve Olson. That trip looked super crazy and skateboarder. So he's confusing two trips. Oh, okay. So the first one is Steve Olson, Barley, and Rally. That's Morocco. Okay. And that was for the first issue, the big first big issue of Skateboarder when I was the photo editor. And then the second issue was Brian Sumner, Adrian Lopez, and Cairo Foster in Vietnam and Hong Kong. Oh, yeah. That's where you shot that iconic photo of Adrian Lopez, the Ollie. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Correct. So the first one, I think the main one he's talking about in Morocco is... Uh, yeah, that was cool. It was interesting because I think I've been to Morocco 10 times and I've spent an over over like a year there in total. Wow, okay. So when I went with those guys, it was cool because we got, like I knew of a few spots that we could go skate and then we really like drove all around the country and... It was a really cool experience. And like, I never studied French, but I spent a lot of time in French speaking countries. Oh, yeah. So, I, you know, I spent a lot of time in Morocco. I spent a lot of time in France. I spent time in Madagascar and uh, Reunion. Yeah, yeah. And I guess that would be all the places. But from that time, for some reason, French sounds more like English to me than Spanish. Oh, yeah? And I can speak a bit of Spanish, too. But, but when we went to Morocco, you know, the, the main secondary language is French. Right, yeah, yeah. Besides Arabic, which I only know very little Arabic. But anyway, when I went there, like, Jeff Raleigh grew up, English people grow up learning French in school. Mm. Um, so he did know French, but he didn't want to use it, and or he wasn't trying to use it. Okay. And it was interesting because I was in charge of these three guys getting hotels and everything. And back in those days, that's it's all that's all it was. It was like those three guys and me, mm -hmm. and it was like no one filming. That was like when photographers were the main thing. But my French during those two weeks or whatever we were there was definitely the best it had ever been because I had to do it. Yeah, yeah, and yeah. I was kind of shocked at times that uh, it really brought everything out. So that was cool. Nice. And whatever. Those guys are all my friends and we had a fun time. And yeah, those are great memories. is from Tommy Guerrero That's so it. he said your use of language is playful slash goofy slash creative where do you suppose it comes from well also that's coming from the goofy slash creative slash funny speaker himself <laughs> I don't know. I don't know where it comes from. I think I've always just liked playing with language. You know, and also just like growing up with the person O that passed away yes, recently. Yes. The photographer, musician. He was my friend since I was like 16. And he had a really unique way of speaking and used funny words. And like, talked, like Tommy has a funny way of speaking. And mm -hmm. 
I just feel like in skateboarding, especially, you know, there was like a period where people are really unique and individualistic in their way they communicated and they express themselves. So, you know, I started skateboarding in 1974 when I was five, you know? Okay. So I I went through like a lot of different periods of skateboarding. I, I feel like in general, I feel like people, they probably know me more in skateboarding in the 90s. Mm-hmm. But, you know, like I'd already been skateboarding for a really long time. Yeah, I know. And like went to skateboard parks as a little kid in the 70s. And, you know, I moved to Santa Cruz when I was like 19 because there was the Derby Skateboard Park because there was nothing. There's nothing anywhere. And then started like living in Spain because they had a lot of skate parks in Spain. And so it's always been a big draw. Mm-hmm. This one is an audio one. Let's see. Timo, it's Andre here. Miss you, brother. Just wondering if you are still skating for Team Wuss. And what was your best bartending experience at Max Fish? We all want to know. All right. That was Andre Razzo. Is that how you say his last name? Yes. The older brother of Mark and Tino. Mm-hmm. And um, another one of my slappy cohorts during my time living in New York City. Mm-hmm. Well, I have always been the team captain of Team Wuss. <laughs> and now I think I might be the exalted lord of Team Wuss because I've, I've just ascended to such a low level. <laughs> so yes, I... I really don't like I don't like skating transitions over three foot tall in general. Mm. I can if I have to, but I don't want to. The wussism is strong in this one. <laughs> and you know, I was not a bartender at Max Fish. I'm sure that I grabbed quite a few drinks or made drinks at times because those are all my friends, all my friends working there, and that those are some fantastic memories. Mm-hmm. But one thing comes to mind. I just remember one time these guys were starting to fight in the bar, mm-hmm. and then I think I was picking song. I was starting to pick songs on the jukebox, but then I then in a way like I I was like oh. This would be perfect. And I put on Big Black's Bad Penny. So basically, I was scoring the fight. (laughs) I was DJing the music to the fight. And my friend Harry was there bartending. And I told him, and he he always really liked that. Harry Drutes. I miss you, Harry. (laughs) Nice. Max Fish was a like an iconic bar in New York, right? Who became like the very like a lot of skaters would go there. But at the time when you went, it was not yet like the skater bar. It was more like the artist kind of bar. Or yeah, yeah, it was. I mean, I think back then also, I feel like skating was like a little bit more. You know, the, like the New York skating thing then was maybe a little bit more like b boyish or like a little less like arty and a little more like a little jockey techie, yeah, yeah, you know? Sure. And so what was cool for me is like, I, I mean, I, I shot photos of everyone in the skate world, but for me, what was nice was Max Fish was not a skater bar. Yeah. Okay. And it, which was nice was it was like, like a space for me to be... Away from, yeah, 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 and then just with my you know art community because I lived in the storefront, two storefronts down was the Legend Gallery, and that's where I lived in the Lower East Side, right? Yep, on Ludlow Street, and then yeah, yeah, it was just like all the artists Mm -hmm. from the area, you know, from older guys like Taylor Mead that were like in the Warhol thing to like Carlo McCormick to like all kinds of different people, and then. You know, all the musicians from, like, whatever, Cat Power to Mm. whatever, John Spencer Blues Explosion to, I don't know, like, whoever, you know, was in the mix at that time. Right. So, yeah, it was just great. Mm. It was a good vibe, and I'm I'm thankful I got to... Live it for a bit, yeah. Yeah. But, oh, also, that's why I mentioned Mark and Tino, Mm -hmm. because Andre was a big part of the, the scene there, and then... I remember like sneaking in Mark when he wasn't old enough and then Mark and Tino both became bartenders there and I think through Mark and Tino that's how and then kind of with the evolution of skating and then becoming a little bit more broad spectrum 
then Max Fish became more of a skater bar. Right, right. Okay. Through those guys, which I love. I love those guys. Okay, I have a couple questions from Andy Jenkins. So he said, was it O that introduced you to the Wizard Crew way back when? What was your first story or picture for Homeboy magazine? Um, I hadn't heard about Homeboy magazine. Was that a skate mag? Um, Homeboy was a magazine that Andy Jenkins, Spike Jones, and Mark Luman made. Okay. And it kind of had skating and music and bike riding in it. And the Wizard Crew... I think who he's referring to mm -hmm. is him and Spike and Mark Luman. I don't re really remember exactly how I met those guys, and it could have been through O. But I do remember one day, and this is funny, because like I said, my mom is kind of like, you know, conservative, mm -hmm. strict. And I was probably about 18 or 19. And those three, Andy, Mark, and Spike, came to my house to go skating. Mm -hmm. And I think they all had different color hair. Like one had red hair, one had blue hair, one had green hair. <laughs> and, and whatever, they were just dressed, which is probably not some way that my mother was used to seeing people dress. Yeah. And then, like, I went skating with them, and then I came back, and then she was just, like, totally freaking out. She's like, what What are you doing letting people like that in our house? And uh, <laughs> and, 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 uh, and she's a Christian, so yeah. I, I would always just, and I'm not, but I would always just, like, be like, wait a second. What would Jesus say about this? <laughs> like, that's, that's what I would say right, right then. Yeah. But I think it's like, in retrospect, it was really funny, you know, like <laughs> Spike became like an Oscar winning director. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then you're just like, in retrospect, you're kind of like, oh, you don't want the Oscar winning directors coming in our house? <laughs> Anyway, I just thought that was really hilarious. But, you know, whatever. It's just like judgmental and stupid. So, uh, Andy asked another thing. He said, who is your biggest collector, if you can say? Mm, I would rather not say. Okay. Yeah. No worries. Then I have a few questions from Skin Phillips. Oh, cool. So he asked a few things. So the first question is, is there anywhere else you'd like to go? And I think yeah, I heard you said you traveled to quite a lot of places. I mean, you've been mentioning Morocco, Europe, and Madagascar, and all those places. Like, uh, is there a destination you haven't explored? Or I think I've been to maybe like one day. I tried to count it, and I think it was like fifty-seven countries, maybe. That's a lot. <laughs> yeah. Let me think. You know what? I mean. I guess it's not another country, but I would like to maybe go and film some surfing in Alaska. Oh, okay. But you know what? I'm pretty satiated as far as my travel's gone. Like, I kind of got it out of me. Yeah. And um, I think it's, it's good because, like, I don't mind traveling sometimes, but it's not as easy. Yeah. Um, the older I get. Yeah, yeah, for sure. And also, whatever, I have a daughter and she's like seven, so. Okay. There's not tons of time to be gone for long stretches of time because I, I want to be really present to her. So Sure. He also asked, best memories of Debunker. And so Debunker was uh, Santa Monica Airlines video from the early 90s, right? Correct, yes. Yeah. And so was that your first video? Because I read somewhere that you had, your first film was A Love Supreme. But then I, I found this thing, and that was a few years before A Love Supreme. But were you maybe not the director for Debunker? Were you just filming for it? or like? A... Um, oh, that's cool. That's cool you brought that up. I worked with my friend um, Steve Keenan on that one. So I guess in some ways more, I was maybe more like the art director. Okay. Of sorts. And like I said before, we were both like super into like Alien Workshop and Memory Screen and whatever. So probably highly influenced by that. Um, I don't think that's hard to see in it. But basically, I just like went to the local video store and rented really weird videos and just stole stuff out of the videos. Mm -hmm. Like midgets fighting or just like whatever weird thing, you know, like caught you your attention. Find. Yeah. 
Yeah, and then mixed that stuff into there and then helped kind of figure out the music. And I did film a little bit, like I filmed a little bit of Super 8 and helped him edit a little bit. But, you know, it wasn't... He was the director, more or less. And okay. um, and he was just really... He's always been really cool. And I, I love Steve Keenan. And he, you know, like he believed in me and, um, you know, got me paid to help him. And at a time when I was very poor and just cool. It was very like a, a really cool moment of like having someone believe in you and being able to show up and do your best and have the thing in the end that that was Mm -hmm. and you know but it was really keenan that was really cool and we're super good friends and Mm -hmm. we used to skate a lot together and so okay do you remember what year that came out i think that must have been 93 around there yeah yeah something like that 92 93 Did uh, your involvement in that movie, did that kind of um, plant a seed for you to get into filmmaking eventually, even though that was only a few years later? But uh... I think the first thing that I made is I made, actually, O had a band called Fluff. (laughs) And me and my friend Crystal Whitworth or Xiaopeng, we made a little video for that. So that was the first thing. Mm -hmm. And then, yeah, I think I was just interested and then uh, eventually, like, I moved to New York and, like, I think I made, I made like, a video for these guys that I was living with called The Unsane that was kind of like a video of slams. Okay. That I just got a bunch of slams from, like, Jamie Thomas and different people. And then I made this, this video. And then, uh, I guess, around the same time, I was making The Love Supreme yep. with Supreme. And, um, yeah, just trying, you know, just really, just trying. Very many. Just, like, yeah, and... Not knowing what I was doing and just learning and trying. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Uh, I have a couple more from Skin. He said, the infamous UK tour with Cardiel and Gons. What do you remember most about those times? So he, w- he was with you on that trip, wasn't he? Or did you stay with him at that time? No, he, yeah, he, he invited me. Like, we were hanging out at, with Tobin mm-hmm. and Luke Ogden. I think Tobin and Luke Ogden and Mickey Reyes all lived together. And then we were hanging out there and Skin was over from the UK, maybe in the spring of like 91 or something. And then he was like, if you want, you can come on this tour or something like that. I don't, I can't remember, but he offered me and I was like, I'm, I'm going to try to do it. Mm. And, uh, and then I hitchhiked across America and all that stuff. And then I got over there and Karma and Alan Peterson were on that tour and they were like really good friends of mine. Mm-hmm. And um, I didn't really know know john but we became good friends and i knew i knew mark from when we were younger and ron chapman and salman aga were on the trip and that was awesome mm. but uh i think the thing that i remember the most about that trip is just like cardiel he was probably like 18 and um wherever we went you know like he was just like eating candy and drinking coke and like smoking hash and just like it's just a ball of energy and then like the the van door would open and then we'd be at like some ancient crusty skate park and then he would just be like flying around and like find the craziest thing and then just do it Mm. like pretty much every place we went to the people were just like no one ever did that before and then you know and john is just so cool and just like just such an extraordinary talent oh yeah so for sure i think that's probably one of the main things i remember okay and thank you skin for inviting me on that trip he asked the last thing he said a good Corey chrysler story would be epic oh you know i i wasn't i wasn't very close to Corey, but i did help edit his part in the debunker video Mm -hmm. which you know i think was kind of infamous for his career and um yeah he was just no holds barred you know Mm -hmm. like for the time he was hucking himself down huge things and him and his friend um, nick foster together were really a cool dynamic combo but they're both not alive now so Mm -hmm. i think they both kind of burn the candles at both ends and Unfortunately, they're not here with us anymore. Let's see. The next one is from Jay Tanju, who was one of the photographers on Yield Destruction, I believe, with Fred and... Oh, well, no, Fred Fred was uh, maybe filming, wasn't he? I don't know. Mostly. It was mainly Brian Gaberman and Jai. Yeah, that's right. Okay. 
So he said, you spent some time living on Maui when you were young and just starting out as an artist. And I'm wondering what impact this time there had on you and what did you learn? Um, I only, I lived in Maui for like six months and... What year would, would that have been? Uh, I guess it would be around 1990. Okay. Oh yeah. So you were like early 20s. Yeah, I lived in, I lived in Hawaii for like a year during that time. I lived in Kauai for six months and Maui for six months. And, uh, I don't know what impact it had on me. Like, um... What brought you out there in the first place? Was it the surfing, I assume? Or? Uh, yeah. Like, my older sister lived there, and I just wanted to experience something else, and it was, like, an easy, like, it wasn't very expensive to get there, and I was able to move in with her, and, yeah, just, I wanted to experience different stuff. And then, basically, I left because I knew that I needed to experience more different stuff. And, yeah, it was cool. It was a good experience, and I got exposed to, like, different culture, and so, I don't know if there's anything, like, huge... That sticks out? No, not, not especially. Okay, let's see. Next one is an audio one. Hey, Thomas. Uh, could you tell us a quick story about your really famous picture from a long time ago of uh, Adrian Lopez hurrying in Hong Kong? I really love that picture. Did you hear that okay? Yes, from French Fred. Yes. We mentioned that photo earlier. It's uh, an iconic one, yeah. Yeah, it's probably probably my my most successful photo of skateboarding, I would say. Mm -hmm. As far as whatever, making a very graphic picture, which I like. I think I saw it on the a recent issue of Closer. Yes. I don't remember which one, maybe the last one or the one before, but I, I saw it and uh, I was like, yeah, the, I remembered it, but I hadn't seen it in a long time. And I was like, yeah, that's really cool that they used it again. Yeah, on the, it was on the back cover of Closer. That's right, yeah. Which is a really cool magazine that Jamie Owens and Eric Swisher make. Yep. And uh, if you haven't checked it out, check it out. Mm -hmm. It's nice that there's, you know, options out there for skate publications. And I like holding magazines in my hands. And yeah. So that's cool. Uh, so the story about that picture, it's interesting how it worked out. So, okay, we fly into Hong Kong airport, right? So you're with Adrian Lopez, and who else was with you? Adrian Lopez, Cairo Foster, and Brian Sumner. Okay. But if you imagine, you fly into an airport, and then when you come out of the airport, as the traffic would go, depending what kind of country you're in and what side of the street they drive on, yep. you come out of the airport, and then your car goes to the right, you know? Yeah, yeah, sure. And that was how it was in Hong Kong. Mm-hmm. So we go to the right, and then we go out, and we go to the city, and we, we spend a week there, and we film and whatever. And then when we, we come back, because we're going to go from Hong Kong to Vietnam for another week. Yep. So then we come back. When we come back, just before the airport, just before the airport building, were those cylinders, right? right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. And those were, they were cement. And I'd always been looking at gas station cylinders like the ones that are above gas station pumps. Mm -hmm. But they were always, th those are always just like metal, like thin metal. And so you can't skate those. And, you know, whatever. I always, always thinking about like the Jeremy Ray gap over the water towers, yep. you know, and how, and how cool that looked. Mm. But then imagining if like it was more like, you know, like an oval and how that would look mm. if you could have something which, you know, you can never find. And um, I've thought about that quite a bit and I've looked at different things and always always looking at different options because I really like wanted to shoot more graphically oriented photos. Mm -hmm. So anyway, when we were coming back into the airport. So you noticed uh, the cylinder things? I saw them, but we had to go right to our plane, right? Oh, okay. Oh, so you didn't shoot it then. Okay. No. And I can't remember if we got out and looked at it, but I don't think we did. I think I just thought about it. I saw them and I realized that they were cement. Mm. And then then we went to Vietnam and when we were coming back, we had like a layover in Hong Kong for like three hours. Oh, and wow. I said, hey, guys, I said, hey, guys, make sure that you don't check your boards in and carry them on the plane because we're going to go try to skate this thing oh, that yeah, I yeah. saw, okay. you know, as we were coming back into the airport. And they're like, okay. And the, so this is at the end of our trip. You know, we this is like two hours before we're flying home. Yeah. So I go out there, we go out there, 
And below those, the cylinders, they weren't as big as they look because the way that I shot them with the fisheye made it look bigger and better than... I mean, whatever. That's my job being a photographer is to try to make things look good. Yeah. So, but below the... And, like, one was probably, like, you know, like, seven feet high. And then the next was probably, like, eight feet high. And the next was probably, like, nine feet high. Okay. They kind of, like, stacked up like that. But they, the, the gaps wasn't that far apart. Okay. I mean, they weren't close, but it wasn't super far. Yeah. And then... But below them, all below them was rose bushes, you know, so thorny rose bushes. Oh, yeah, so not, not the best place to stand and uh, take a photo, yes. Or, no, or if you fell off. Oh, yeah, you're well, going, that too, yeah, of course. Going into the rose bushes. <laughs> okay. So we got out there, and it, and it was like right at the end of the day, so there wasn't very much light. Yeah. And luckily I had a roll of 3200 black and white film. And I remember that the light was just fading and fading. Yeah. And so basically, like if you know anything about cameras, I pushed the 3200 roll to 6400. I remember all of this. Okay. And generally, you don't want to shoot a still picture at less than probably, you know, like a high speed moving thing like a skateboarding. Probably you don't really want to be below a thousandth of a second unless you want blur. Yeah. So I didn't I didn't want blur. So I was shooting. I went down to 500, which you don't really want to do. And it was wide open at 2.8. And so it was just like at the edge of like being able to shoot it. Oh, okay. And uh, if you look in the background, there's some lights because lights are already coming on because it's that dark. And um, anyway, I got the shot and then I then I continued and I shot more with flashes and I got a few other ones with flashes, but the ones without the flash and specifically the one of Adrian turned out the best. Yeah, it turned out the best. So awesome. and yeah, like and like you said, yeah, it's probably the most known or remembered photo. Yeah, of all the ones you took. Yeah. And those guys were cool and Adrian's Adrian's awesome and I think he he always says that that was his favorite trip and yeah, and we we just had we just had such a nice time. Okay, I have just a few last ones. So this one is from Matters, Matters Apps, who was part of your movie uh, Cuatro Sueños Pequeños from 2013. And he asked, what is the difference between a video and a film? Well, that's funny that he would ask that because he thought it was very funny. Because we're, when we were making Cuatro Sueños Pequeños, it was all on film. Yes. 16 millimeter. And I guess a film could be on video as well. But if you're shooting something on film, I guess generally it is a film. Mm -hmm. uh, so definition-wise, I'm not sure if I'm exactly the right person to say it, but, but he, he would always be like, we're making a video, and he, he would just like to fuck with us. Okay. <laughs> but he's a funny guy. I really like him. All right, I have two quick questions from Todd Francis, a fellow oh, artist. Cool. So he asked, do you ever get tired from painting and need to take a break? And do you think your eyes would be less tired if you didn't use all those crazy colors? Uh, the first part of getting tired from painting, I guess we kind of talked about it earlier, like that you like to do different kinds of arts so you don't get burnt out on just doing painting or just doing filmmaking or just sewing or something. Yeah, I mean, I, I think I just... At this point, I just have kind of a natural movement of moving from one thing to the next. I mean, a lot of times, you know, if I'm having like a major exhibition, like in a museum or something like that, mm -hmm. I'm not doing exactly what I want. Like painting for like 15 hours a day for four months straight is not always what I want to do. Mm. But also those situations create a momentum which creates work that pushes into new realms that I normally wouldn't do. Mm -hmm. But the circumstance creates the situation to do new and interesting work. Mm -hmm. And then, yes, I am generally ready to take a break after that. And then I would say like something interesting about the color. I generally paint in studios and my studio generally doesn't have great lighting. Mm -hmm. And I kind of don't worry about that because I'm interested. What I do is I just like mix the colors in not great lighting. And so I'm always like making the colors like brighter than they are. Mm -hmm. So then when you put them in a gallery or a well lit situation, 
then they're quite bright and like almost like psychedelic mm. almost like you're on mushrooms or something <laughs> Because I feel like they, they're they just resonating at a higher level because cause I'm trying to make them bright in the dark, in a dark scenario. I see. And okay. then when they get well lit, then they go pop. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Which I really like. So I guess if you look at my paintings and you feel like you're on mushrooms, then I've achieved uh, what I'm Your going Your purpose, for. yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay, I have some questions with uh, Benjamin Debert from France. Great. Hey Thomas, Benjamin, it's been a while since we had a talk about what's hot and what's not at the moment and I was wondering what type of skating and what skaters in particular you were finding exciting in 2024. Um, I mean, it's interesting because like I'm pretty removed and like I think it's interesting that like say like I see I see people giving like Bill Strobeck kind of shit for like his style of filming. Yeah. But to me, I'm like, that's the best. Like for me, I like that the best. Mm. Like I like a different way of filming. And I feel like I like what Bill's up to. I like I like the skaters he works with. I watched that Baker video the other day and oh, I yeah. really like the latest one. Yeah, and I, I like that Casper guy. And oh, yeah. He films with... I like how fast he skates. Yeah. And I like that he... You know, like he works with Bill, too. And oh, yeah. some of the stuff I that Bill uh, shoots of him. he's the team. Yeah. Yeah. And um, I'll go back to Bill, but the other person that I really liked in that new video and whatever is a friend of mine and, and we work together is um, John Dixon. Like, oh, I really yeah. like... yeah. He just has such a unique, like, snap and tightness to everything he does. Like, everything's just really powerful and big and just really good. He's yeah. and he's just such a cool guy. We, like, I congratulated him the other day on that part because it was so good. He was in uh, You Old Destruction, right? Uh-huh, yeah. Yeah, we were talking about that, just about missing those times. That was a nice... It was just a nice time. It was making that movie, I think, for a lot of those people was different because it was more like getting to hang out with a lot of different people that they might not have known or yeah. they might have liked, but then in more of a relaxed situation where it wasn't all about huge hammers. It was more about having fun. It really showed in the in the movie, yeah. And then I can't remember. There's this one kid that Bill films with. He's like a black dude, and he's just got a really like like a loose style. Uh, cater? No, no, no. He's like a little bit like lighter, like lighter skin. Oh, Caleb Barnett, maybe. I think so. Yeah, that guy. For hockey. Yeah. Oh, he's just he's a butter incarnate, <laughs> like that guy. Powerful. I just really, really enjoy just how effortless a lot of the things he does yeah. looks. Yeah. And then I guess I guess the last thing that I would say is um I mean I'm afraid for them, but I really like the GX oh, yeah. crew. Yeah. Like uh, I'm sure it's not gonna end well. Yeah. Uh but yeah, and Ryan's a friend of mine and you know, I'm down with like what he's up to and, and just like a lot of those dudes have like really good styles too yeah. and like they just attack kind of like crazy stuff that's just like it's really Nobody creative. Nobody else skates like them. Yeah. No. They're really in the no. league of their own, yeah, for sure. Yeah. So but I am afraid for them. It's scary to watch. Definitely. And, but anyway, yeah, I'm I'm a big fan of theirs as well. So that's cool. Yeah, it looks like you're you're quite tuned in on uh, what's coming out, and but yeah, I assume you don't watch everything that comes out every day on Thrasher or whatever. Like you'll pick and choose like certain things, like the Baker video or like a new Bill Strobeck montage or something. Yeah, I'm not super up to date, mm -hmm. but I check in here and there, and I'm not too worried now. I'm just whatever. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. All right. I have another question from Benjamin. What would be your ideal session in 2024? Spot and music playing in the background. Well, because you're asking, it would be me and you and you being uh, back to your skating self and skating the vag. Oh, yeah. In Paris. And uh, yeah, if that's still there or not there, it would be recreated for our session. Mm -hmm. And uh, I don't know, music in the background... Maybe the original lineup of the Misfits. 
<laughs> okay. <laughs> At Notre Dame, I think that would be great. The misfits on top of the bag. That's an interesting contrast. <laughs> cool. Yeah. Yeah, La, La Vague isn't there anymore. I don't know when they tore down the spot, but uh, it's been it's been gone for a while now. Yeah, unfortunately. Yeah. Well, we Benjamin and I used to. It was our favorite spot. Team Wuss was in full effect, <laughs> and we'd go there all the time. Like I used to spend a lot of time in Paris, and he would let me stay at his spot. And mm-hmm. yeah, it was just great. It was wonderful. That was actually his next question. Let, let me just play it for you, but it was concerning La Vague. Uh... Describe the magic of the wave. Um, I don't know. I mean, it's just, it's like a natural wuss paradise, you know, <laughs> like, it's just like small transitions, a little tight, and I could kind of like do probably whatever I could do on the on it. Mm-hmm. And it's just like in the middle of Paris and and you could skate there at any time and no one fucked with you, really. Not that I can remember. And whatever, like Benjamin's uh, one of my best oldest friends, you know, like, Mm. you know, it's kind of a little bit of like his mentor for shooting pictures. And yeah, we were just like good buds. And Mm -hmm. and I don't know. It's interesting also that you're calling me today to do this interview because I feel like I feel like the Europeans in general probably get what I'm up to more. And okay. and over the years, like the French French people have like, you know, I'll be different places and then, you know, different French people will talk to me about the work that I've done. Mm-hmm. And the way that they'll express it is like how I hope people would see it, but generally they don't. Okay. But maybe by the cultural lattice that the French people climb on, it enables them access to like different viewpoints that somehow resonate with the work that I do. Mm. So it's interesting. And even all the people you chose and uh, yeah, I, I appreciate your interest and um, I can tell that you're understanding some, you know, yeah, at least part, part of it. Yes, for sure. Sure. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. And same with Benjamin, you know, yeah, yeah. like whatever we, I think we've always had like a nice rapport you know, like I worked with him at Sugar Magazine. Oh, yeah, yeah. I guess I was like the the editor abroad for Sugar. Oh, I didn't know that. That's awesome. I had some title. Okay. And I actually got paid. It was it was kind of one of those cool times when like you help someone out a lot and then they, they take care of you. And it was really cool. Yeah. And we did great. a lot of cool stuff together. I love Benjamin. I just have a, a few last ones from him. Oh, yeah. Where is your skate photo book, by the way? I'm not going to make a skate photo book. I like some of the pictures that I took, but also some of the time I was a skate photographer was like big pants, small wheels era. And like, I just don't ever want to look at that stuff again. (laughs) Like, it just looks horrible to me. So... I think that's what this next book is about, is about making kind of something that encompasses everything from music to like more abstract photography to portraitures of people in all walks of life. Yeah. So anyway, sorry, Benji, no skate book. (laughs) But a book, a book uh, with some skateboarding in it at some point. Yes. Yeah. Okay. All right. Two quick last ones. For you, what's the appeal of uh, analog when it comes to filmmaking or photography? You know, I just feel like when you're using film, especially in moving pictures, that it just gives you a range, like a depth of emotion. It's just right there. You know, it's it's easy to access. It has a warmth and a depth. And also, I know how to use it. Mm-hmm. And I feel like with video, like, sure, you can do good things with video. I'm not I'm not anti video, but I feel like it's harder for me to get the video to feel deeply emotional. So I'm more attracted to film. I feel like in still photography these days, I feel like it's difficult to get like the film processed and scanned really well. Mm hmm. And that's kind of inspiring me less to shoot still analog photography, mm-hmm. but I still am. And uh, honestly, it's it's in the end, it's probably a dance partner that I know how to dance with the best. Mm-hmm. So that's probably what it really, really boils down to. 
And I do, I do see people doing really cool things with video. And I am using video in some circumstances and digital photography in some circumstances. So, mm. Okay, last one from Benjamin. Most fun scanner to shoot with. Anytime, any era, any city. Hmm. That's a hard one. <laughs> you know, I'm just going to go, it comes straight to my mind. Yeah, yeah. I would just say, I remember just having one specific session shooting photos of Tony Hawk. Mm-hmm. And this is probably 20 years ago. But I could just, t- I could just, like, I, I also know historically, like, all the tricks he can do. Yeah. And, you know, where, where some people might not even know what to ask. Mm-hmm. But, like, we worked together, like, when I was the photo editor at Skateboarder, he was the editor. Uh-huh. So we're friends, and we had a rapport and, and whatever. But I could just be like, hey, Tony, can you do a stale fish right here? Mm-hmm. Or can you do, you know, an andrect here or whatever? And like pretty much like within an hour, like I just got to shoot so many things and he liked it because he was like, oh, I haven't done that in like 10 years. But he was so good. He's just like, you know, like he could just do anything. Yeah. And he's like a really good guy and and really smart. And, uh, you know, there's a reason why he's so at the forefront of things in skateboarding. Yeah. So um, and he can talk. So, you know, like. <laughs> If you can't talk, it's hard to advance. That's true. You know, so. It sure worked out well for him. Yeah, and whatever. I I guess the other person I would say, like, at a specific moment like that would probably be Ethan Fowler. Oh, yeah? Okay. I mean, he was pretty young, so it was like, he was probably like 16, 17. Like super early days of him getting on stereo? Yeah, or even before when he was on Toy Machine. His first pro model was on Toy Machine. I forgot about that, yeah. Okay. But he was just like such an incredible talent. And we were good friends and skated together a lot. And he just could do whatever and whatever he wanted to do. It looked so good. Mm. So that was that was amazing. And whatever. Maybe Evan, too, at yep. a certain point. Evan was great. Evan could do anything. Mm. But, yeah, I don't know. There's There's a lot of people. Yeah, yeah, no, definitely. Yeah. Are you still involved with uh, UMA, the board company that um, Evan, uh, I don't know if he started it, but I, I understand you were involved at the launch doing the, the art direction and everything. Is it still the case? No, no. I I was only working for them for about a year. And um, it was, um, I guess, in the beginning, it was partially my company. Okay. But it just... Uh, I guess in the end, you know, that it was kind of like when it started, they were kind of like, here, here's the keys to the car. It's your car to drive. You're the creative vision of it. And then after a while, they were like, oh, give me back the keys. <laughs> <laughs> like, we don't like how you're driving. <laughs> okay. And whatever. And I'm like, you know, I, I took the job because I was given the keys. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So um, anyway, it's fine. It was a good learning experience. And in the end of the day, I got to be really aware to balance my life these days just so. Yeah. I could be present to my daughter and be a good dad and all that stuff. So Mm. it worked out. And uh, I think at the time it was it was a hard transition, but now it's fine. Okay. Yeah. So, yeah, I just have two quick last questions to finish this off from Josh Stewart. I'll have you listen to this very first one. Hey, Thomas, I got a question for you. So. I'm curious which you started dabbling in first. Were you first interested in photography or painting and uh, visual arts and which kind of informed the other? With photography, I feel like there's kind of a, a constant debate of how to make photography go from just capturing the moment to actually making an art form out of it. You know, I mean, with skateboarding, it's very often, you know, capturing the moment. And I feel like your photography a lot of the photography I've seen and know kind of goes beyond that, you know, and it looks, there's, there's something more to it than just um, capturing what's happening, you know, the, the physical act of what's happening in front of you. So, you know, that's my question essentially is, is what makes photography an actual art form or how do you personally take your photography from capturing the moment into an art form and how does your visual arts side of of your passion inform that in your photography and vice versa okay um 
I guess the first thing is is that because of skateboarding, probably when I was about like 14 Mm -hmm. or something, you know, like I was really inspired by like Todd Swank and Neil Blender and maybe like Chris Miller and Pusshead and Mm -hmm. like different people kind of in skateboarding. Because, like, they were making zines and their own graphics. And then I think, I mean, I think when I was, like, 13 or something, I was like, I'm going to be an artist. Mm-hmm. Like, I I just... You already had that vision. Okay. Yeah, and I was totally horrible at it. <laughs> and then I just kept trying. And, um, you know, probably also, like, what helped is, like, especially, like, Todd Swank, because his drawings were... You know, they were pretty crude and like Mm. I was like, I could try to do something, but they were really cool, but they were a bit crude. And I was like, I could try to do something. And the fact that they were kind of like not that far away, possibly they're black and white and probably done with a Sharpie. Uh You know, they were not really inspiring. And then, you know, I think I'm realizing more as I get older that. You know, like I came into nothing like I came into photography, not in a normal route, you know, like Mm -hmm. I took a few classes in like in junior college or basically say I could use the darkroom. But I feel like everything like I just have like an artistic viewpoint towards it. And like I'm not really too concerned about the rules or what the people that are like really formal about it think. Sure. Like I don't give a fuck, and then I'm like mm. generally attracted to the people that give the less fucks <laughs> in general. Yeah, yeah, for sure. So I just want something that's like graphic and emotive, and I'm always searching for that in whatever I'm shooting. And I, I don't think it's the same. I don't think that that other people are like look at it the same way mm-hmm. because. I feel like also skateboarding can be a lot of skateboarding is pretty is a pretty jockey. It's just like dudes trying to do the gnarlier thing than the other guy. Yeah. And then, yeah. you know, the gnarlier front side flip down a bigger set of stairs. Mm. And I was just always interested in like making a crazy picture out of like a crazy situation. Yeah. Or an emotive picture or something. So like, I really liked the period that I was involved in with, like, colored flashes and long exposures and lights flying everywhere. And mm. Like, I just thought it kind of expressed the wildness of the scenario. And um, I think, you know, it's all fine, whatever. But, like, the clean kind of jockey skateboarding stuff has never been, like, my not a part of my interest. And um, I think maybe I even said it before, but I'm just not that interested in, like, the jockey side of skateboarding. Yeah, more yeah. Ex- interested in the more expansive artistic expression right right of course and you know maybe the anarchistic revolutionary mind of it so Mm -hmm. you know which some people don't like yeah yeah. you know like i was talking about bill strobeck you know people i'm surprised that people don't like that i think it's revolutionary you know but yeah anyway Maybe it's a bit of jealousy, too, with uh, Bill, because his uh, yeah. videos are becoming so successful and Supreme has become such a gigantic thing. Uh, so maybe just a bit of that, too. Probably. But uh, are there any photographers today, like current, whose work you admire or, or you like? Uh, is there anyone that comes to mind? Oh, uh, yeah. Why well, can't I remember his name? Pricey Hot. That's his. Yes, Pri- uh, Matt Price. Yes, yes. Yeah, Matt, oh, Matt yeah. Price. Yeah, I like. Red. I like Matt Price. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I think we're thinking around the the same kind of way, and um, just trying to look at things different. And mm. yeah, I like what he's up to. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, I think I think my maybe my favorite all time skateboard photographer. I don't know. It's probably Brian Gaberman. Oh yeah. Like okay. He's not doing that now, but, like, I don't know. I mean, whatever. Of course I like Dan Stewart, and of course I like Grant Britton. Yeah, yeah. Spike Jones. Like, Spike was a, actually a big influence. He actually taught me how, basically, I oh, called him on yeah. the phone phone from Spain, and he taught me how to use the camera. Right, right. I, I read about that somewhere, I think, maybe in your Chromeball interview. Yeah. But, yeah, I love, I love Spike's work, and... Mm-hmm. He was pretty free and creative in his pursuits in his skateboard photography. All right. Yeah, let's do the second part from Josh. I'm curious if you or, you know, some of the other guys, your contemporaries from your generation, if you guys see 
your influences in the medium of skate photography, skate videography, and uh, editing. I feel like there's a specific, you know, selection of artists from the early 90s to mid 90s, maybe a little bit before that, who've kind of like created the look or the archetype of what we see, you know, skate videos and skate photography as, how we, what we expect from it. And do you see that yourself? Do you see some of your, you know, your, like I said, contemporaries influence and yourself in modern skate media? And uh, how does it make you feel? You know, if you do see your own, you know, a reflection of stuff you guys have done, how does it feel to see that, you know, in, in modern stuff from, from new, newer generations and younger kids making the new media of today? Well, let's see. Well, I'm stoked that Josh wanted to ask me questions. I'm a fan of his work. Mm -hmm. So that's cool. Um, I have seen some things that seems like it's related to like things I've done. Mm -hmm. I think I would rather not be the person calling those things out. Like maybe someone else can do that. Yeah, yeah, sure. Um, But uh, I have seen some things. And, you know, like I said, like I think Spike created a lot of the the context of how skateboarding is perceived and you know like with the blind video and his photography i don't don't think people might even realize how impactful he was but he's very impactful yeah you know then then all the all the things he did in the girl videos which are really you know made those really special in Mm -hmm. a lot of ways so yeah i think i see it you know and then i feel like skateboarding's gone it got so serious you know yeah like I like how there's a more playful side now. Like it seems yeah. like it got so so serious for a long time that there was no not a lot of room for expression or creative weird shit. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Which is like kind of the whole reason I'm interested in skateboarding is that side of it. So Yeah. And then now it seems like with the kind of the breakdown and the proliferation of like a lot of different small companies and people, you know, whatever, skating curbs and just doing whatever the fuck they want. Yeah. It seems like things are a little bit more grounded or more creative and more like homespun, which I think is cool. Like, I think it's fine. I feel like it's fine. Like if the old companies kind of die, Mm. I think it's totally fine. Like, if you're not functioning, if you're not a productive organism that's, like, contributing anymore, die. Yeah. Go away. Yeah, yeah. You know, like, and I think it's cool. I think it's, I think a lot of the the younger brands and what are those guys called? I love their videos so much. European guys. What is it called? Uh, Polar? No. Well, I love, I love Pontus' work. I love, I love his videos. Yeah. You know, like the the main guy that makes the videos, he's like he has like a man bun, and he oh and he yes like, yes Gustav Tunison, yeah that's uh, sour yeah. sour oh yeah sour I love the sour videos yes yes me too like yeah. I just really like also I like how it's just all new spots and those guys are so creative super creative yeah 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 I mean also that's another reason like I like I like Pontus's videos too and I and I don't necessarily know all those guys so yeah no for sure it's just fun those guys have really cool styles and just like a cool like kind of friend family vibe and yeah yeah, yeah it's so good yeah well let, let's wrap it up here because otherwise I'm just gonna keep shooting questions at you and you need to get going but uh, thank you so much Thomas I really appreciate you uh, taking the time to chat uh, it was really really fun cool thanks for doing all the research and um, oh my pleasure and getting all the, all those people involved and um, yeah. those are all a lot of people that I really like and um, I think that's a good format to have an interesting conversation that's it for my conversation with Thomas Follow him on Instagram at Thomas Campbell Art. Go check out his website, thomascampbell-art.com to buy some of his art on the web shop. Treat yourself to some of his amazing skate and surf films that we talked about throughout our conversation. Debunker, A Love Supreme, Cuatro Sueños Pequeños, Ye Old Destruction, and many more. And keep an eye out for his upcoming surf film, Ye Wu. Thank you for tuning in. See you soon for a new episode of Beyond Boards.